coming to our author event this Sunday. And uh, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers who are here. And happy Mother's Day to our author, Megan Marshall. She's the mother of two daughters. And uh, if you read today's Boston Globe magazine, you would see that she's featured in here. And they said that she gave birth to triplets. <laughs> and they were talking about this book, The Peabody Sisters, which was just published in April by Houghton Mifflin. And um, the book has been receiving glowing reviews in the Boston Globe, the New York Times Daily, New York Times Book Review, Plowshares Magazine. Uh, I'd like to share with you now from Francine Prose's review in the April 17th New York Times Book Review. Um, to write a group biography that also conveys the history of an era and a place is a massive enterprise, one that requires the writer to keep the threads of the story untangled, even as the characters' lives overlap and converge. Marshall, a specialist in New England and women's history, has done a fine job of organizing and presenting excerpts from the voluminous letters, many of them previously undiscovered, and documents she located in the course of a project that took her almost two decades to complete. So, um, <clears throat> before we welcome her to talk, and she will be, she will uh, talk to you and she will read from her book, and then she'll take questions, and after that she will sign copies of the book you may have, and uh, there also are copies for sale. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Megan Martin. Thank you very much. I just thought today I'd start with a few Mother's Day thoughts that are occasioned by the book and by, by Concord. Um, it's just um, very moving to me to be back here in Concord where, in a certain way, this book started. Of course, Concord is a big setting in the book. and. Um, I still remember coming here for the first time, of course I've been to Concord before, but um, almost 20 years ago when I had decided to write this book, um, my mother was still alive and was visiting from California. And she came out and with my uh, two-year-old daughter, we visited the old manse and she stayed outside with my daughter Sarah and they traipsed back and forth over the stone wall while I took my first tour of the old manse and began to get sort of a feeling of uh, feeling for place. Um, my mother's no longer alive, but um, it's nice to think of her out there at the old man's. My daughter's now 21 years old. <laughs> um, well, the book took a long time, and a big reason for that was uh, these letters, which I, I've passed around a few of them to you who were, who were here earlier, the cross-written letters. Um, of course, this the handwriting was difficult to read. There were hundreds and hundreds of these letters scattered all over the country because the Peabody sisters were involved with such famous men. Their letters were very collectible early on. So the Huntington Library in California has them, the Morgan Library, the New York Public Library, and I tracked them all over the place. But um, since it's Mother's Day, I'll admit to you that another reason it took a long time was that I've been a soccer mom and a Suzuki violin mom all these years. <laughs> And a lot of this book was written um, by carrying around the manuscript in the little folders and in the car as I was um, <laughs> sitting there at a soccer practice or an orchestra rehearsal and, and reading over and over this, the hard copy of what I'd done that morning on the computer. Um, sometimes I felt that was a little frustrating that I couldn't just go, go at it. But I think in retrospect that was part of what helped me develop the voice of this book. It was. Um, it was a book that was written about women, women with you know, the some, sometimes similar conflicts in their lives. And uh, I needed to have a voice that could really carry through any sort of distraction. <laughs> and I think that helped. Um, I also want to just um, mention my, the influence of my grandmother, who was um, the children's librarian in the town where I grew up in Pasadena, and a professional storyteller. And, um, I used to spend every Thursday afternoon with her shelving books. And her voice, I think, the, the storytelling voice is something that's always been very powerful and motivating to me, as well as that time spent in the library, sort of behind the scenes, so that these many years in the archives reading these letters felt really very comfortable and, and home-like to me. And also, um, I wanted to mention my mother, who was, um, like Sophia Peabody, a landscape painter. and and uh, struggled in her life to find a place for her art uh, in, in uh, a world of family and, and work. Um, so that said, I'm going to read a little bit from the opening of the book. Um, and, 
as Francine Prose noted in her <laughs> review of my book, the biographer always struggles to figure out where to start, particularly when you're writing about women who um, are not that well known nationally. Probably many of you know something about the Peabody sisters, but I figured that a larger audience wouldn't. So I decided to start in the middle of their lives. And this is a scene also, I think, appropriately that takes place in, in a bookstore, probably one of the most famous bookstores in the country. Um, certainly had a place in, in literary history um, and the history of reform. And then there are also a few scenes set in Concord, which I hope you'll like. So here's the beginning. Prologue, July 9th, 1842. And if you can't hear, raise your hand, but I'll do my best. Summers in Boston were just as hot in 1842 as they are today. A building boom in the past decade had changed the seaport town, incorporated as a city only 20 years before, into a metropolis of brick and stone. Sea breezes didn't stand a chance of reaching beyond the granite market buildings and warehouses that now fronted the docks, let alone the brick row houses that crowded every street up to the common and the massive copper dome of the State House. State House did have a copper dome in the early part of the 19th century. Tightly packed neighborhoods that seemed pleasantly intimate in winter grew unbearable as several days of rising temperatures and mounting humidity turned the city of nearly 100,000 into a furnace with few sources of relief. The frog pond on the common was one oasis. There, near sunset on days when the thermometer refused to drop below 90, Strolling couples could enjoy an accidental splashing from the dogs that capered among the small boys with their toy sailboats at the water's edge. Elsewhere in the city, the air was stifling, tempers flared, and sleep was difficult until the inevitable thunderstorm cooled the cobblestone streets and brick sidewalks for a night and a day, and the whole process started over again. It was on a Saturday morning in July when bright, overhot skies seemed destined to turn thick with storm clouds by mid-afternoon that a small wedding party gathered in the upstairs parlor of a modest three-story brick row house, no bow front, no bay window, on West Street, a half block from the common and the splashing dogs in the frog pond. The bride was a small woman, just under five feet tall, whose size and childlike manner belied her 32 years. Dressed in a gown, she and a friend had stitched together hastily the previous month and trimmed with borrowed cuffs, her light brown hair braided and decorated with pond lilies. Sophia Peabody, the youngest of three remarkable sisters, was about to become the first to marry. The three Be Peabody sisters, Elizabeth, Mary, and Sophia, had scarcely been lacking for offers of marriage. Indeed, Elizabeth and Mary each secretly prided themselves on having turned down perfectly eligible, admirably persistent suitors who, to their minds, simply weren't good enough. Men of fortune or of intellectual promise, but not men of genius. If the Peabody sisters were to marry, they would not make the same mistake as their mother, who had married young for security, only to be disappointed in the man she had chosen. It was largely thanks to their mother, however, that the sisters had been able to maintain their high standards, despite the family's relative poverty. Mrs. Eliza Peabody had deliberately raised her daughters to discover and develop their own talents in order to become independent and useful, as she wrote, so that they need never rely on men. It was no accident that she had named her daughters for an English queen, the Holy Mother, and the Greek word for wisdom. Mrs. Peabody was a firm believer in woman's destination for a sphere of action infinite in duration and boundless in extent, even if this destiny lay in the far distant future, and her three girls, so linked in heart, in opinions, and in talents, in her view, had done their best to hasten the day. The house at 13 West Street, where the family now gathered, was itself a monument to Mrs. Peabody's ambitions for her daughters. True, it was on the wrong side of the common, as far as residences were concerned. West Street wasn't Beacon Hill, nor was it close enough to the small enclave of comfortable houses still clustered around Church Green, the last vestige of fine living near the waterfront, to be considered fashionable. The house itself faced a livery stable, but the Peabody women had no intention of maintaining a conventional household. The oldest daughter, 
Elizabeth, now 38, had chosen the building in 1840 for its location just around the corner from Washington Street, Boston's Publishers Row, as an ideal spot from which to launch a foreign language bookstore and her own publishing business. And she had managed to persuade a wealthy backer to loan her the money uh, to stock the shelves. Since then, Elizabeth had succeeded in making the atom of a shop that occupied the first floor parlor famous well beyond city limits as the in-town gathering place for New England's transcendentalist ministers, writers, and reformers. Elizabeth's bookstore, crammed with hundreds of books and journals imported from Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, many of them circulating as part of a subscription library, brought an erratic income for the Peabody family, but provided steady intellectual sustenance for a diverse group of devotees to what was beginning to be called the newness. Men and women, Elizabeth wrote in an article published in the transcendentalist journal, The Dial, who have dared to say to one another, why not begin to move the mountain of custom and convention? I should say that many of these books, those that remain, are in the Concord Library in the special collections. On Wednesday evenings at West Street, the sisters held open house, where an invited cast of free thinkers met to lay plans for projects ranging from the utopian community at Brook Farm in nearby West Roxbury, to new churches led by the radical Unitarians James Freeman Clark and Theodore Parker. On Thursday mornings, Margaret Fuller held her conversations for women in the book room, drawing out the voices of the wives, daughters, and sisters of the movement's founders on matters of philosophy, religion, art, and politics. The future abolitionist Lydia Maria Child and the suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton were among the women who fell into Fuller's web of influence by way of the weekly conversations. But Elizabeth Peabody, who often held the floor, needed no prodding to enter the marketplace of ideas. <coughs> Already the author or translator of a half dozen books, founder of her own magazine, and contributor to the liberal journals of the day, Elizabeth had now also become the publisher of many of the region's literary lights, Nathaniel Hawthorne, William Ellery Channing, Theodore Parker, and Margaret Fuller. Since January 1842, Elizabeth had taken over as publisher of The Dial to work in tandem with the new editor, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Business at 13 West Street was by no means limited to the ground floor. In the upstairs rooms, Mary Peabody, the middle sister at 35, taught a girls' school on weekday mornings, tutored schoolboys and young women in French, German, and Latin in the afternoons, and wrote textbooks on subjects ranging from elementary grammar to geography and botany in her spare time. Mary's most successful book, The Flower People, a children's horticultural guide, was in its third edition, published by her sister Elizabeth. Upstairs, too, Sophia Peabody, the sister who everyone agreed possessed the greatest spark of genius, maintained an art studio in her bedroom where she painted landscapes and modeled busts and bas-reliefs in clay to be cast later in plaster, or perhaps one day in marble. Although her output was slim, limited by the severe migraines that had plagued her since she was a teenager, Sophia was one of just a handful of women artists in New England whose work was shown or sold with any regularity. And now, Sophia Peabody, the youngest and most fragile of the sisters, the daughter apparently most dependent on her dearest mother in the world, was about to leave this vibrant household to start one of her own. The wedding on the morning of July 9, 1842, seemed the culmination of a transcendentalist fairy tale. After a three-year secret courtship, Sophia was at last to marry the increasingly famous and famously handsome author, Nathaniel Hawthorne. <coughs> she would ride with him that afternoon to Concord, Massachusetts, <coughs> where, the people would take, where the couple would take up residence in a house selected for them by Ralph Waldo Emerson, dine on the produce of a garden planted for them by Henry David Thoreau, and spend their first night together on a maple bedstead hand-painted by Sophia herself with designs based on Italian Renaissance frescoes. Yet even transcendental fairy tales have their dark sides. United as the sisters seemed to outsiders, and linked in heart as their devoted mother believed them, the three had always been prone to covert rivalries and shifting alliances. The July wedding was the result of Sophia's having set her cap for a man her oldest sister had loved first, and whose genius Elizabeth Peabody had been, uh, been among the first in New England to recognize and promote. 
The dark-haired, moody Hawthorne had entered the Peabody household first on Elizabeth's invitation, been declared handsomer than Lord Byron, the first by Elizabeth, and had confided his fiercely guarded ambitions and private torments in intimate conversation first to Elizabeth. How must Elizabeth have felt this Saturday morning in July as she watched her youngest sister glow with anticipation for her marriage to the man Sophia gushingly called the very king and poet of the world? Or Mary, for that matter, whose own heart was preoccupied by love so far unreturned, for a man who had, like Hawthorne, once been Elizabeth's nearest companion. Only four days earlier, on July 4th, the Independence Day parade had passed the Peabody's West Street house with Mary's beloved Horace Mann at its head, leading a procession of elected officials, ministers, school teachers, Sunday school children, and Revolutionary War veterans through the streets of Boston to the Odeon Theater, where Mann would give the most important speech of his life. After an exhausting five-year campaign as Secretary of the state's first ever Board of Education, Mann had succeeded in persuading the Massachusetts legislature to vote him a lavish budget to reform the Commonwealth's school system, which might be a good idea right now also. <laughs> Until he met Elizabeth Peabody 10 years earlier, Mann had not taken the slightest interest in the cause of education. Now, the six-foot-tall, silver-haired reformer was exhorting his listeners to pour out light and truth as God pours out sunshine and rain, go forth, and teach this people. His speech was so instantly popular that 20,000 copies would be in print by summer's end. Yet it was Mary Peabody who had become Horace Mann's confidant in recent years, editing his manuscripts, even contributing anonymously to his common school journal. Still, Mann's heart remained a mystery to both sisters as they attempted to reconcile themselves to life at West Street with the breakup of the sisterhood. Although Mary had done Sophia the favor of setting up the house in Concord during the last weeks of June, she too was beginning to tire of her little sister's self-congratulatory effusions. By the end of the summer, Mary would be chiding the still euphoric newlywed, you know, dear, there are different kinds of beautiful lives. And Sophia, on the morning of her wedding day, she turned to two close friends rather than to her sisters to help her dress for the ceremony an event that itself had been much postponed. Originally planned for mid-June and finally set for June 30th, the wedding date had to be pushed back again by over a week to the dog days of July, as Sophia was repeatedly overcome by mysterious fevers and palpitations. <laughs> After three years of secrecy, the month preceding the wedding, when the whole world knew at last that Sophia Peabody and Nathaniel Hawthorne planned to marry, had been fraught with tensions. Sophia's friend and mentor, Margaret Fuller, had written a peculiarly brief note of congratulations, closing with the ambiguous excuse that great occasions of bliss, of bane, tell their own story, and we would not, by unnecessary words, come limping after the true sense. <laughs> Was Fuller jealous as well? For Nathaniel Hawthorne himself, Fuller's feelings were strong and undivided. If ever I saw a man who combined delicate tenderness to understand the heart of a woman, with quiet depth and manliness enough to satisfy her, it is Mr. Hawthorne, Fuller had written, leaving Sophia to wonder how she had come by this understanding. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia's prospective in-laws, Nathaniel Hawthorne's widowed mother and two unmarried sisters in Salem, had done little to welcome her into the family. Perhaps the last in all of New England to learn of the wedding, due to Hawthorne's obsessive need for privacy, all three refused to attend, citing inf insufficient time to prepare their feelings. <laughs> Congratulations had come only after the writer had traveled to Salem and urged the Hawthorne women to reconsider. His older sister Elizabeth, nicknamed E.B., once a close friend of Sophia's, had at last conceded grudgingly that the match might prove a good one. Still, she pressed Sophia, have you no dread of the cares and vexations inevitable in married life? Evie could have been voicing Sophia's own doubts when she wrote of her preference for situations unlike marriage, in which women retain the power to withdraw, and of her reluctance ever to feel as if much depended upon me. 
And what of her husband, as Sophia had referred to Nathaniel Hawthorne since their engagement at the New Year 1839? In the past month, the writer seemed no less flighty than Sophia, the woman he liked to call his little dove. At times, he badgered her in letters, complaining about this worthless species of communion and refusing to write my feelings any longer. He'd already delivered her well over a hundred passionate love letters, some 70,000 handwritten words in three years' time. He vowed to take up his pen now only to convey external things, business, facts, details, and insisted that the wedding take place in June as first planned, counting off the remaining days of the month. He teased her with playful accusations. Had she begun to tremble and shrink back and mock threats? Ah, foolish virgin, it is too late. Nothing can part us now. But for the most part, Hawthorne tolerated the delay, confiding in his journal that he could think of no more pleasant way to spend his summer afternoons than watching the passing scene at the frog pond. Like Sophia, he had been born and raised in Salem, Massachusetts, not, but to a family long associated with the sea. His father, a sea captain, had died of yellow fever in Suriname when Nathaniel, when Nathaniel was three years old. The sad news took weeks to reach the young family waiting for him at home. Hawthorne himself had never shipped out as anything other than a passenger, but perhaps it was fitting that, as he was about to embark on married life, he became fascinated with the miniature sailing vessels on the frog pond, all perfectly rigged, tossing up and down on the mimic waves and their little boy captains, so well acquainted with all the ropes and sails. What was it about the whole effect, he puzzled, that kindles the imagination more than the reality would? Although capable of periods of intense work, Hawthorne was at heart a lover of indolence, ready to admit his own idle nature. Like his bride-to-be, he had suffered from numerous undiagnosable complaints as a child, permitting him to stay home from school and lie in bed reading for months at a stretch. When Sophia's dallying carried over into July, he insisted they put off the wedding until after his 38th birthday, July 4th, so that he could watch the fireworks on the common. Hawthorne would not have been among <coughs> the sober patriots who trailed Horace Mann to the Odeon Theater on the morning of the 4th, but he was there in the crowd of nearly 100,000 residents and revelers from surrounding towns to witness a display the newspaper called the most splendid ever seen in New England. The region had been the first to emerge from the shadow of financial panic that overtook the young nation in 1837. Boston bankers had shrewdly steered clear of the machinations of the Bank of the United States, which still hobbled New York City and Philadelphia and the construction of railroads connecting Boston to inland markets had recently made it the leading port city of its size in the Union. Now some of the city's new wealth had been put into an Independence Day extravaganza. At 8.30 p.m., two bands started to play, and as darkness fell, a series of illuminations began. Italian suns, revolving pyramids, Persian flowers, interspersed with flights of pigeons, and culminating in a 110-foot-long magnificent temple dedicated to liberty, which burned with silver fire. The evening's brilliant spectacle ended in a grand feu de joie as a hundred rockets exploded in the smoky night sky, releasing colored stars, gold rain, and serpents over the heads of the assembled multitudes. In the final weeks of June and early days of July, the nervous couple reassured themselves with the notion that they had been married since the day they agreed to an engagement. The ceremony is nothing, Sophia wrote one close friend. Our true marriage was three years ago. Hawthorne joked that rather than unite them, the minister would thrust himself between us when he made the marriage legal at last. The two hoped, after a summer's honeymoon, to continue their creative lives together. Sophia had many visions of great deeds to be wrought on canvas and in marble during the coming autumn and winter, and Nathaniel expected the contentment he achieved by finally marrying his blessedest Sophia to offset the financial pressures that came with taking a wife. He planned to support the two of them with the sale of stories he had already begun jotting down in his notebook. Yet, how could they be sure it would all work out? Clearly, nothing could have been more frightening than marriage, for two people so accustomed to exercising the power to withdraw whenever they wished. Sophia, in her spells of illness or artistic inspiration, 
Nathaniel, by retreating to his study to write, or simply leaving town on long summer rambles, keeping his whereabouts a secret so that he could not be reached even by letter. Since their engagement in 1839, the two had rarely even lived in the same city. The Peabody's were still based in Salem when Hawthorne took up his job as measurer in Boston's Custom House that same year. The job Elizabeth Peabody had found for him meant to provide a steady income and minimal obligations so he could write without financial worries. Instead, he'd become a wage slave, too tired to write after his days spent among the brawling slang wangers on the waterfront. He carried Sophia's love letters in his breast pocket as tokens of his imaginative life and lived for her rare visits to Boston and his rented rooms on Beacon Hill, which she decorated with two fantasy landscapes of Lake Como, an idealized vision of the engaged couple painted as tiny figures into the foreground of each one. Hawthorne found the painting so redolent of private meaning, sacred in his terms, that for a time he had hung black curtains over them to be parted only when he was in the room alone. <laughs> Then, there had been the six months during 1841 that Hawthorne had spent at Brook Farm after Sophia had moved to Boston with her family. The couple had hoped to make the fledgling commune their first home together until the reclusive Hawthorne lost patience with his fellow utopians, as well as with the hours of hard farm labor required of the residents. This was a man who had spent most of the decade following his college graduation closeted in an attic room in his mother's house writing stories, most of which he tossed aside as un unpublishable. It was a testament to the strength of his love for Sophia that he would consider taking up the communal life at Brook Farm in order to give his bride a home. And even now, after three years, how could such a man hurry into marriage? Yet there was an undeniable yearning toward each other as perhaps there could only be for two so alike in their simultaneous wariness and longing for connection. Sophia, whose innermost dread was to be consigned to a life utterly destitute of imagination, was more than willing to offer Nathaniel Hawthorne the adoration he still lacked from his public. At 38, he had produced just one volume of stories, twice told tales, more of a critical success than a commercial one. His set of three children's books brought out by Elizabeth Peabody, publisher, had done little to expand his reputation. And so when Sophia wrote him that the world's admiration for him centered in her own adoring heart, called him king by divine right, and offered reverence along with her love, the lure was too powerful to resist. Being pervaded by your love, he told her, I would write beautifully and make myself famous for your sake. He needed this woman who gets into the remotest recesses of my heart and shines all through me. For Sophia, who had struggled to find her place in a family of strong-willed women, succeeding most by retreating into illness, it was both a relief and a revelation to fall in love and find her love answered. Words cannot tell, she wrote Nathaniel a year before the wedding, how immensely my spirit demands thee. Sometimes I almost lose my breath in a vast heaving towards thy heart. She had come to believe that, for me, there is no life without a response of life from thee. So the hour came on. The young minister, James Freeman Clark, a frequent guest at the sisters' Wednesday night gatherings, arrived promptly at 11. Clark had never met Nathaniel and Gore admitted to Mary afterward that he was stunned by the writer's singly book his perfectly sculptured feet of dark eye, high brow, and shock of black hair, he had trouble performing the ceremony. <laughs> Sophia then, Clark's sister, the painter's aunt, and the memorist, Clark, joined the Peabody business. Downstairs, the sister's aunt, Sophia Pickman, one of Mrs. B's three younger sisters, arrived too late from some. She glanced around at this journal, and, reluctant to agitate two lovers, left for offering congratulations. By noon, the had taken place, Hawthorne Sidlum. We the Christian came straight to paradise. The actual journey was a less the strip. Seven miles outside Concord as the road west in the 90 degree. They were by low fence like a little artillery. By the rain, Sophia rode the next. Taking refuge inside tavern, the newly made a flower until a still gleaming dust called us to proceed. The delay of Sophia chance to take note of the change in own internal weather. 
after weeks of headaches and fevers, she noticed that with every step it took, I felt better and not least hot. Her husband, believing he had Sophia to him at last, looked upon me as upon a rosh which would suddenly disappear. The Hawthorns reached the at five o'clock and entered their new house, the one parsonage known locally as Old Man, where they found his powers arranged for them in Evan. The next day, the couple grew a perfect Eden and walked through the fresh green trees to its newly erected battlement, feeling like Adam and Eve, no one sight. So far, felt certain a clear new life beginning for her. It had been the years since Daniel Hawthorne had written to family, How sweet my leaf, and how sweet my wit, when I should think your breathing self in my arms. What a happy and holy fashion it is that those who love one another rest on the same pillow. Now conquered, sharing a pillow with his fist, he felt he was beginning to be as if world were heaven. Back in Boston, however, the stood at 91 degrees under no sign of rain. At 3rd West Street, Mrs. Eliza Peabody began to think about how to get along without her invalid daughter, whom Sophia's empty studio given her to order following the economies that Peabody had first learned as a girl in revolutionary times, and then just about her <coughs> married life. She beat the faces of her two remaining daughters. Certainly she knew there had been tensions, nothing to compare with that of her own childhood. Very different is the effect felt by others who love from a condition of each real worth, she answered and told her oldest daughter, from a mere animal attached or being nurtured in the same house. Nurture was scarcely a word from Miss Heba's own disjointed upbringing. She had told the story, or parts of it, many times over to her three daughters, careful to impress upon them the lesson she had learned. It was ironic that Sophia had chosen a literary man for husband, exactly the sort Mrs. Buddy had to fear. Then, Sophia, all sensitive and easily upset, was the one of her three daughters to whom she had never confided the most shocking tale of her childhood. She never expected Sophia to marry anyone. No one had. <laughs> children did Sophia have? They had three children. They also had three children. And um, although that's not part of what's in this book, they uh, did have quite different ideas about raising those children. The Hawthorns were um, relatively permissive and didn't want their kids to start eating. I don't to read till age seven or till, as Sophia said, till they lost their baby teeth, <laughs> which was, I realized, as part of the Waldorf um, school philosophy, um, the Rudolf Steiner philosophy, I don't know quite where it comes from, but um, whereas Mary and Horace Mann had their oldest son in a, at a desk by age four, <laughs> and I think he was learning French as well as, yeah. as English. Um, what I, brought you to this topic? Oh, well, that is a good question. Um, before I started working on this book, I, I worked as a journalist, and I was writing about um, what were then contemporary <laughs> women's issues in the uh, late 70s and early 80s, and um, I got a little frustrated with what I kept hearing from women then, that, you know, we're the first generation to go out to work, we're the first generation to have conflicts about uh, our professional lives and our personal lives, and I thought, you know, this can't be so. So I determined to find a group of women who had left a record of their lives and, and uh, just, you know, something I could really put my finger on as opposed to women's lives day, all was changing. Um, and I had also studied um, American history and literature uh, in college and been a bit frustrated by the lack of, of presence of women in, in the curriculum then. It's very changed now, but I just felt there had to be some women um, besides, although I, I loved Hawthorne and Melville and Emerson and Thoreau, I, I loved them and I still love them, but I thought, you know, there has to be more women there besides Margaret Fuller, who not mm -hmm. to say anything against Margaret Fuller when Paula Blanchard is here, but it's a kind of uh, token tragic heroine of, of transcendentalism. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so these Peabody's emerged and, and they had um, really more letters than I could possibly have, have imagined. It became a little bit overwhelming, but I was very, very glad to find them. And one of the things I came to believe um, through working on this book was that women's letters and diaries of that time are really their words to the world. You know, some people would say, don't you feel a little guilty reading all this private mail? But there are so many wonderful perceptions and insights and descriptions, and, and uh, I think these words were, were meant to come out now. <laughs> Thanks.
give any insight into why these women's lives were so thoroughly buried and that uh, they, like their contemporaries, you know, had no historical uh, important significance or uh, legacy until yeah. you know, folks like well, you Well, they by. struggled with that at the time, you know, and uh, one of the poignant things I kept finding, if you were Elizabeth Peabody, who was really quite brilliant and had her own um, theories that she kept trying to sort of had transcendentalism towards a more kind of utopian communitarian movement um, and I found uh, you know I found evidence of that but she kept saying well you know 20 years ago I said that you know in later letters um, mm -hmm. I, I was saying this um, she didn't <laughs> would never want to really say I was first but she said you know I wrote this out and and I loaned it to Ralph Waldo Emerson and he wanted to copy <laughs> it down in his journal and and so I really support him, you know, that's what she would say. I, you know, he's not the only one who, who's, uh, who's um, got these controversial ideas. That's sort of as far as she would go towards claiming. But, but this, this same little set piece would come up every ten years ago when, or so when she would have, have a chance to, ha you know, write something reminiscent about the transcendentalist era. Um, so anyway, what I mean to say is that the same reasons now that women's lives are sometimes not seen uh, would you know apply just as much then, and they struggled with it. They struggled to put themselves forward, and they struggled with finding any way to leave their own record, which is why we had to go, or I had to go, find their private writings. Um, it's a struggle. We'll do better. <laughs> Was it difficult to write uh, about the Peabody Sisters when the last book on the Peabody Sisters of Salem uh, yeah. was mm -hmm. reprinted in '88? '88 is that when it was? Yeah, but that was a little more recently, but. Um, well, you know, I um, do you many of you know the Louise Tharp's book, The Peabody Sisters of Salem, which I think is you know did a great job to keep the Peabody Sisters in in uh, people's minds. It came out in 1950, and um, you know when I first read it, um, I could see it was not that well documented, and that Louise Tharp, although she was a passionate advocate of these women, had not really read their writing much. I mean, aside from their private writing, she didn't read Elizabeth Peabody's published works or, uh, and she didn't, one of the things that I really also try to do is read the books that the sisters were reading themselves to understand what was in their heads. Um, and I found some really wonderful um, sources that I used in the book. So what I really tried to do after looking at it was just not look at it ever again, because I also had a sense that um, some of these, there was some embroidering going on there. And, and although, you know, people have had to use that as the major source on their own, it's really, um, you know, there, there was a lot of work to be done as far as, as greater documentation and accuracy. But, so I did, my heart sank a little bit when it came out again, but on the other hand, you know, the more interest in the Peabody's, the better. And um, I hope, you know, people seeing that book will then find my book or vice versa, they can make up their own mind. But there's someone with a question here. Yeah. I was just wondering where, where one could see supply of Lauren's uh, paintings. Oh, anywhere? well, that's a good question. There are, um, and it also brings up another great soccer mom story. Um, <laughs> there are two paintings at, um, that have been at the Peabody Essex Museum, the Essex Institute, for you know as long as I've been working on this book. Um, and they are paintings that she painted in Salem. Well, actually, one of them is the first painting that she ever did, which was a copy of a Washington Alston painting. That was how she was learning to be a painter. And then another one that she painted in Salem to sell at a fundraising fair. And I don't really know how they landed there. Um, they're not being shown right now, but you can ask to see them. And then um, when I started working on the book, I uh, put a, one of these little queries that they unfortunately don't put anymore in the New York Times or New York Review of Books, you know, I'm working on this book, would anyone please, you know, if you have material, contact me. And, and some Hawthorne descendants wrote to me and said, well, we have two paintings. And, and these were just absolutely wonderful paintings, um, two lands, this, these two landscapes of Lake Como that I mentioned in, in the reading here. Um, and that's how I knew, you know, that it was Sophia and Nathaniel in the foreground. And, and so I went to see those. And, and um, this past summer was the bicentennial of Nathaniel Hawthorne's birthday, and so this descendant, who's now in her 90s, decided that she would donate these paintings to the to the Peabody Essex. So they are there too. Um, so there are four paintings there. There are sketches 
in various archives, sketchbooks, and that sort of thing. But um, the peculiar experience that I had was, uh, I told you I've been a soccer mom all this time, and my older daughter, great, passionate soccer player, and played on this sort of regional team of all-stars, and, you know, they were out there kicking the ball and banging into each other, and there was this girl on her team named Cherry Pickman who, you know, was the roughest of them all and the foulest <laughs> mouth, and, and uh, I'd known the, that her and her family for a couple of years when we went down to a tournament in Rhode Island near their house, and they invited us over to the house, and I walked in the door, and I just had this feeling about this painting on the wall. It was a landscape, very old and not in the best shape, and I said, that painting, you know, where, where, where did you get that? And, and um, suddenly it dawned on me, Pikmin, you know, Pikmin. I've been writing about these Pikmins in Salem in my book endlessly. They were a, a, a wealthy family and benefactors of the Peabody's, and, and um, I knew that Sophia Peabody had sold a pair of landscapes to the Pikmins. Well, so, well, Tim Pickman, Jerry's father, said, oh, I just, you know, recently inherited this from my grandmother's estate. She was an art collector. She mostly had contemporary art, but there were always this pair of paintings on the stairwell, and nobody, you know, nobody ever identified them. She said, he said, my sister has the other one. So I went to look at that, and I just, um, I'm still kind of in the process of getting these authenticated, but um, I don't see any reason not to think these were two, you know, so making four, and suddenly now there are six, six no. Sophia Peabody paintings. Um, there are some others that have been misidentified in, in Louise Tharp's book, and um, that I don't really, I mean, they may be her work, but there's no reason to think that they are, so, yeah. I saw her two paintings at the Peabody Museum oh, really? years ago, and mm. I was flabbergasted. Aren't they, they wonderful? Representational uh, landscapes, they were excellent. Yes. But then she had been educated to be an artist. This wasn't some, so you know, by number. So no, no, but she <laughs> did have a, I mean, I think this was also kind of hard for her. She had a great talent, a great facility for this, and she could just kind of do something wonderful. Um, and then people expected her to keep doing that, and I think she had a lot of trouble. She didn't really feel confident in her skills. And um, another great thing that luckily I found a, a, a nice photo of is um, she did, she turned to sculpture after a while, which was something that the transcendentalists loved sculpture. They thought this is, you know, this is the essential form and, you know, forget about landscape. We'd rather just be in nature. We don't want to see representations mm -hmm. of nature. So, so she turned to sculpture yeah. for a while and did, um, actually there's a medallion, uh, a bas-relief profile of Charles Chauncey Emerson, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson's favorite brother in the Emerson house. You can see that she did, but she just did just one three-dimensional bust of Laura Bridgman, who was the, a young girl, the sort of Helen Keller of the 19th century, and it's a beautiful thing, which I, at least you can tell it's beautiful in the photograph I happen to find uh, from it that's from around 1903. It's, it remains, the, the object itself is at the Perkins Institute for the Blind, and it was just plaster, and it's kind of crumbled a bit, doesn't look very good anymore now, but luckily I found it. Anyway, so that was, again, her first effort was amazing, and then she didn't do any more. So uh, anyway, you can read what I think about that in the book. Um, anything else? Yeah. What are you working on next? Well, I'm actually, um, as, as I was um, working on this book, I sort of cast my net wide, and I, I knew that anyone who knew the sisters would would be important and might have something interesting to say. So I spent a lot of time reading the letters of, you know, ancillary family members, and I became really fascinated with the letters of Elizabeth Hawthorne, Nathaniel Hawthorne's older sister, who I quoted a little bit also in this passage with her, um, her statement about the uh, power to withdraw. She was just quite an opposite person from the Peabody sisters. And she was a recluse, but a brilliant woman, and her letters are great. And and. Uh, since it's Mother's Day, I will tell you my favorite quotation from her, which is so anti-mother in a way. <laughs> she, said, she advised her niece, who was then 29, she said, consult your comforts and forswear self-sacrifice. <laughs> so that's what we can do today. <laughs> so, um, I guess maybe that, oh, one last question. Um, can you say a little bit about Mary's relationship with Horace Mann? Oh, yeah, well, um, with who? Mary and Horace Mann, um, she, uh, Mary, I found out, um, 
And, and this is kind of interesting to contemplate because it's really, it makes you realize what a different era it was and a different time for women. Um, she was not at all hesitant to say that it was her ambition from childhood to find a worthy man to marry, a, a man who might make a great contribution in the world. And, and that was, um, she read novels that involved that sort of plot and, and um, she had, you know, she was the most, thought to be the most beautiful of the sisters. Sadly, there is no portrait of her from that time. But, um, so she had a lot of men who were interested in her, but she put them off. But when she <coughs> met Horace Mann, somehow he was the one. He had recently been widowed, and um, she writes in a, she, one of the great documents I found was a short story that she'd written uh, kind of about this falling in love, and then her um, conflict with Elizabeth over it. She disguised the names and changed the characters a bit, but it was not very well disguised. <laughs> so, so she really did seem to fall in love instantly, and, um, and then struggle with keeping this love secret because she knew he was mourning and it would take a long time to get over it. But she became his partner, and they were once married, very much a, a, a working couple, and when they when they married, they went on a honeymoon with um, Samuel Gridley Howe and Julia Ward Howe, who had also just been married. They went to Europe and spent their time um, visiting jails and um, <laughs> special schools, schools for the blind, and, and um, trying to figure out, trying to take ideas from there, or seeing if there were any ideas worth bringing back to the United States. Mostly they kind of frowned on what was going on in, in, in uh, the old world. So. Way. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And Thank you.